we are already uh, using an experimental approach and we intend to follow that. Um, so we are constructing protocols, implementations, and enabling businesses to run on the system and, and probably start doing business in Q4 of this year. But uh, for the next few years, we anticipate that, uh, that Ethereum will be, uh, many aspects of Ethereum will be a research and development project. Um, and we will devote a, a lot of resources to uh, basic research in the, in the cryptocurrency space. Uh, research that not just Ethereum can benefit from, but uh, other cryptocurrencies as well. Um, so, uh, we intend to uh, experiment in simulation. Uh, some of that's just getting started now. Um, and we also intend to experiment on the actual system. Uh, essentially, we can, we can create distributed applications in different styles and, and see which ones work. Um, we can do AV testing variations um, and gather statistics on, on what's working and, and what's uh, having issues. And uh, since we intend to be agile and iterative uh, when, we, when we learn something, um, and we're pretty confident of it, we will build it into upgraded versions of the system. Um, so Ether, Ether is the, the crypto fuel of the system. Um, it, uh, it needs to be issued. Um, at distributed applications on the system will we'll use Ether to pay for transactions and to pay for the computation that they do. Um, and so there needs to be a, a liquid usable pool of ether in order for these businesses to, to operate their systems. Um, we will issue a bunch of ether in the pre-sale to people who buy it um, for use in their businesses or to people who buy it for speculative reasons. Um, We'll issue some, uh, much smaller numbers than have previously been published, to some of the early volunteer contributors. Um, and the rest will be issued through mining uh, from the Genesis block on. So uh, the Ether issuance model refers to the perpetual creation of Ether uh, as compensation to miners for securing the Ethereum network. Um, we have a fixed linear annual infl inflation rate of 30% of the amount of ether that's sold in the pre-sale. So if uh, 1 billion units of ether are sold, 30% uh, of that will be newly created every year. So uh, you can see that miners will um, have a very important role in the system. Um, so ether issuance model. Um, Ether will be continually issued at a target rate of a, a certain amount, of, um, an amount per block called the block reward. Um, and this will create perpetual inflation of the monetary base. Um, Bitcoin is uh, similar up until the year 2140 approximately. Um, uh, we go forever in terms of uh, in terms of inflation, um, but since the ratio of the amount of ether created each year to the amount of extant ether will be constantly falling, um, this can be considered a deflation or sorry a disinflationary model. So disinflation um, for anyone who hasn't or doesn't understand that term is it's different from inflation and it's different from deflation. It is essentially a uh, reduction in the rate of inflation. So if this year inflation was 10%, next year it's 9%, next year it's 8%, um, that's a disinflationary economy. Um, so while Ethereum will use uh, a pre-mine of Ether to fund development of the ecosystem, um, di different from Bitcoin, Bitcoin was developed in an experiment, experimental environment with nobody watching and it doesn't really run applications. Um, 
Ethereum is going to be a very different kind of entity. Um, it's going to need a full business ecosystem up and running on day one. And so instead of instead of letting miners turn um, turn their the product of their mining into burning electricity and creating waste heat, um, we will do a, a pre-mine and allocate some of uh, that ether to uh, the developers who uh, need to be fed and pay for rent and stuff like that. Uh, so Bitcoin had very few developers and still has very few developers. Ethereum, in order for it to be successful, needs a, a vast developer network. Um, so the pre-mine um, used to fund development uh, is skewed in favor of miners. So that, that relates to um, what I mentioned before, that 30% of the pre-mine sale um, is uh, going to be recreated uh, for, in, and uh, allocated to miners every single year. The constant annual issuance of Ether will enable miners to earn new Ether in perpetuity, uh, even as the rate of monetary growth in percentage terms tends to zero. That's the disinflation. So this achieves both perpetual inclusiveness, there will always be the ability to mine um, and the ability to create and acquire new Ether. Um, and it also achieves the important characteristic of disinflation. Um, and that's one of the, in many people's opinions, one of the central aspects that drove uh, the adoption of Bitcoin. Um, the fact that people believe that uh, uh, they had an asset that had the chance over a long period of time to be a stable store. Uh, so the transaction and computation fee model. So transaction fees and computation fees are different notions on Ethereum, and both of them are present. Fees in the system are not burned. We consider destroying Ether um, to pay for computations, uh, but instead we, we are currently favoring a model in which we distribute um, computational fees to miners, uh, since the miners are the ones who are paying the expenses for processing transactions and contracts. Um, transaction fees will initially be fixed, um, and they will be determined by estimates of costs of network transmission, data storage, proof of work, data processing, etc. Um, it's expected that these costs will be below the maximal average amount that a transaction sender would agree to pay um, to derive the expected utility of having that transaction done. Um, so fees are unnaturally low to start with. Um, during the initial period, in which transaction fees are fixed, they'll be very small uh, to encourage use and growth of the Ethereum network. Um, uh, even below-cost transaction fees will likely be acceptable to miners, uh, since they'll be making most of their revenue um, on the block rewards. Uh, so transaction fees, like in the Bitcoin system, will be somewhat inconsequential for a while. Um, and uh, it's anticipated that miners will support initiatives that, that uh, promote growth of the ecosystem. Um, the block rewards will enable a, a very cost-favorable early business development environment on Ethereum. And, uh, we are going to go out of our way to promote uh, the development of businesses on this ecosystem because um, we're building a platform, but uh, it's pretty useless unless uh, a lot of people get involved offering services on so as soon as possible, transaction fees will be made variable with price levels being set by market mechanisms. But that's the ultimate goal, really. Um, miners, we, we want market mechanisms to essentially um, manage almost everything on the system. Um, miners will choose what fees they're willing to accept for processing a given transaction based on the nature of the um, and economic actors, either contracts or people who send transactions, will decide what size fees they're willing to pay for processing a given transaction. So these two forces will converge in a dynamic market clearing price. Um, in terms of, so that was all for transaction fees. In terms of computation fees, we intend to follow a similar path where computation fees are set artificially low initially 
um, and then market mechanisms take over. So this will enable distributed apps to have artificially low costs of doing business uh, in the early stages of the business endeavor, and will enable them to develop in a less expensive environment so that uh, um, when computation costs do grow over time with the introduction of market mechanisms, um, these businesses will be more mature and have a better chance of, uh, of being viable. Um, so again, below-cost computation fees will probably be more than acceptable to miners since they'll be getting the big block fee. Um, they'll be making the bulk of their revenue on block rewards um, and will likely support an initiative that fosters the growth of, uh, of uh, an ecosystem with low-cost business startup. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, let's, let's take questions. So if they're short questions, yeah, I'll relay them I, to you. I, I, had one, I had one more point, but I think it's going to be covered in one of the questions. So I'm going to say it. Okay, so if so they're short, if they're short, just shout them out and I'll relay them up here. Uh, if they're long, please come up. So in the back. Uh, Joseph, the, the question is whether you can. I heard, I heard dagger. Okay, great. Yeah, just will will dagger be used, or will there be something else used? Um, so dagger is a possibility. It's a fallback condition. It's uh, it's been demonstrated to be not uh, anywhere near optimal for our purposes. We we do want to create an ASIC hard mechanism, uh, so it will involve sequential processing. Uh, and probably a lot of memory uh, in, in the uh, proof of work or hybrid proof of work, proof of stake algorithm. Um, we anticipate to have a, sort of a round robin of algorithms um, to make it more expensive to develop an ASIC. Uh, we anticipate to be changing proof of work algorithms over time to make it less attractive. To, uh, to devote resources to building ASICs. And uh, so, so essentially, Dagger could be one component, uh, but it's going to get, uh, we're going to try and make it as complicated as possible um, to um, get really sophisticated about the mining. We anticipate probably the best kind of mining rig will be uh, commercial off the shelf. Uh, blade servers with uh, very fast memory. So something, something that uh, maybe my grandmother isn't going to buy, but um, but a lot of people could could have running in their home. Uh, and of course, there will be warehouses of people who uh, who optimize every little thing. Uh, but that's fine. Um, in terms of um, so, so we will have a set of um, proof of work, proof of stake, hybrid type algorithms initially, um, and we anticipate, we are, we are, as I mentioned before, we're going to be funding a cryptocurrency research group. It will probably be based at the uh, University of Waterloo and uh, Koblitz and Menendez uh, to inventors essentially of the cryptography of the big two part of it. And uh, we intend to have contests to, um, to help the uh, Define and create proof of work or security model systems, um, and we intend to fund research in that direction. Okay, uh, so there's a gentleman here, please. How many sets of currency crosses are there going to be? Aha, uh -huh. did you hear that one, Joseph? How many sets of currency? How many sets of currency crosses will there be? <laughs> I guess what you're thinking is uh, how many... currency crosses? Probably an infinite set. Uh, we, uh, uh, Ethereum is a platform, it's not a cryptocurrency platform, it's a, a platform for building cryptocurrencies and other distributed applications. Um, we anticipate that uh, people will build their own crypto tokens as shares in distributed autonomous organizations. Um, we anticipate that um, companies will build royalty tokens. Um, people can build their own person tokens. You can, you can create your own token and give it to somebody as a sort of IOU. And once they have it, they can buy maybe one program power from you. Um, so, 
So I guess. So, do we, go ahead. So I, I think one thing that is to be sure that is that you're hoping the number of currencies would increase. So it sounds like you're thinking about currency trading, and the question is how many currencies could be traded, I think, is what you're asking. And, and I think there will be an increasing number, maybe not. And I'm guessing, Joseph, you don't have, you don't know exactly it's how not, It's not a quantitative question, it's a qualitative question at this point. To this point, um, there's no evidence that there will be an Exchange mechanisms are, are numbered, and there's a fairly small number of them around the world. Um, we are envisioning uh, a qualitative change in the sense that you can create exchange mechanisms on the spot that last for the next two hours uh, if you want to. Um, it, it will become a very fluid, uh, liquid, uh, easy task to do. Um, you will go tools to enable everybody to issue their own shares of currency, etc. Um, in terms of trading these things, uh, we will have distributed exchanges on Ethereum, and uh, it will be uh, trivial to, to list any sort of token for exchange. The markets will, uh, um, exchanges, markets will um, be able to handle any sort of uh, pairs. Uh, did you hear that one? Uh, the, the question is, if, if you if you create your own currency, will it have a relative value versus Ether? Uh, of course, absolutely. Well, and I guess um, maybe the, if, if you if you are uh, a spectacular programmer or a spe spectacular fruit arranger or whatever, and you create ten units of fruit arranging currency, um, and uh, let's say they're discrete units, you know, so they're only, you um, can't divide them um, infinitely or indefinitely. Um, those units could be priced in Ether, or they could be priced in Bitcoin, or they could be priced in software development uh, token hours. Um, and it's, it's a market. Uh, so if the supply of those things is small compared to the demand, because you're the best food arranger in the world, um, those 10 units will each be worth a lot of ether. Um, if, uh, if you're not such a good food ranger and, uh, and you created, say, a million of those units, they'll be worth virtually nothing. Did that answer your question? Yeah. I had a question here, gentleman in the green shirt. Oh, yeah. Um, I was working how far along the path you are to figuring out how much ether you need to be mined to get the sort of price ecosystem. Um, what, um, so, uh, Joseph, the question is how, um, uh, how much, let me see if I can repeat it exactly, the question is how much, how soon will you know how much ether will need to be pre-mined to get the basic e ecosystem going? I think, uh, that's that's. I was trying to be as direct of a quote as I could. Um, so we anticipate that uh, there will be uh, significant interest in in the presale. Um, so there will be a lot of ether out there initially. Um, we anticipate that a lot of that will will be illiquid. People will hold on to it. Um, uh, a bunch of it will be issued as an endowment for development to Ethereum. Um, so Ethereum will have its own pool that, that it intends to pay developers uh, with, but that pool could also be used to ensure that there is sufficient liquidity of Ether in the system um, in order to enable businesses. If there are just so many businesses and business activities and transactions on the, on the network early, and if that swamps the supply, that the miners are are spitting out into the world, then Ethereum has the option of uh, of selling or releasing some of the endowment ether, um, just to make sure that uh, the economy is running smoothly. In, in general, we don't intend to be a central bank. But we don't intend to have that sort of control. But in the bootstrapping stage, we need to lead, we need to guide, um, and we need to. Uh, 
will cobble the system until it's uh, strong enough to stand on its own feet. Uh, the question is, how did you get involved with Ethereum? Um, well, my background is uh, technology and finance. Um, so I've been paying attention to Bitcoin for a pretty long time. Um, uh, they were Alex ratings, and uh, we both come from the same hometown, Toronto. Uh -huh. So uh, essentially at Christmas, uh, uh, we were talking and, uh, and we started talking about these ideas that he's been um, tossing around with a few people and writing up. Uh, so I think he spent a bunch of November uh, writing. He, he, uh, he spent the previous approximately year um, working in different projects, uh, master coin, card coins, etc. Um, but he's been traveling around the world. Um, Observing and participating and founding some of these cryptocurrency 2.0 efforts to build uh, sophisticated mechanisms on top of the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, or failing that um, on top of uh, a different blockchain. And he, he just uh, is an amazingly smart kid, and he just uh, realized that uh, all these smart people that he's been working with are just banging their heads against the wall. Um, Bitcoin it is great at what it does, um, but Satoshi did not want to experiment um, with a rich scripting language because there were security implications and he was already experimenting with a consensus mechanism and a transaction mechanism not to work with without bringing about the headache of, of, of Turing completeness. Um, and so um, Vitalik realized that uh, Bitcoin was a, a pretty narrowly defined protocol and uh, so it came to SMTP. Um, you can write a great mail system on SMTP, uh, but uh, don't, don't try to write uh, something like Skype on it. Um, so he set out to define and create essentially the TCP IP, the, the general protocol um, that would support uh, a number of applications um, on the blockchain. Okay. So anyway, back, back to my story. I um, started talking with a couple of the founders in Toronto in December, um, and they invited me to, to become a part of the project. Ah, good. Wonderful. Uh, Chris. so much uh, uh, need uh, of using Ether that uh, would not be feasible to use it for the lower value contracts. It, how do we can fix this problem? Uh, Joseph, the, the, the question is, is uh, he's, he's foreseeing the possibility of some contract or or, or a group of contracts creating so much demand for ether that there would be, it would be hard to use it for some other purposes. So I guess it's the, the diversity of the, the ecosystem. You know, it's sure. If, if, those, if those contracts are set of contracts are economical, if they are earning um, enough ether to pay their expenses, then they have a right to do whatever they want to do. Um, I anticipate that there will be a, an enormous number of different efforts that, uh, that will be able to share a, a big powerful blockchain and all the processing that it affords. Uh, we also anticipate, um, um, as maybe some of you do, that this system could become enormous and pervasive um, and could undergird uh, a huge amount of global economics and global social systems. Um, and so you can imagine that a lot of computation will be done by all the nodes around, around the network um, and block time is one minute. So a lot of computation will have to be done by 
each node in one minute. And so um, that, that's the way it's going to work in version one. Every node will have to uh, perform the computation of every contract. Um, but uh, in later versions, we're um, looking at a, a shard model, where shards, sections of the network, um, of essentially subsets of the nodes, will process um, subsets of contracts, and other subsets of nodes will verify subsets of contracts, and there'll be economic incentive to both process the contracts and to verify. Wonderful. Chris has a follow-up. Ideally, uh, you, you, okay, go ahead. So my follow-up is like, uh, what I'm envisioning is that like, uh, you know, the contract is going to be completely skewing out. Like if you have like a contract that is extremely, extremely valuable, since the adder is necessary to make work all the network, the adder for that contract is, uh, I mean, it's going, the value of the adder is going to be so high, becoming so high, that it's pretty much funny by So I guess Chris is uh, coming back to, this is Chris Cinelli, he's coming back to the question of uh, uh, if there is a contract which is just so valuable that it, uh, that, uh, it uh, too, that the price of ether goes so high that it, that it would make it tough for anyone else in the network to be, to be used. Am I catching it, Chris? I mean, it's, 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 so, so the contract implements such such a valuable business that, that it attracts a vast majority of the ether far in excess of its expenses? It's not a matter of budget, it's how much the ether is going to be valuable. That, I mean, it, 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 to run a contract, you need to run some ether, they structure it, uh, the same way for all the contracts, so, Yeah, so uh, Chris, I think part of the problem, part of what the answer is, is that uh, the, the, the questions, or remember the uh, ether values were market, the ether is market based. I mean, the, the yeah. fees are market based, so it might be that uh, your. But ev every, I mean, the instruction set, they're going to have the same uh, amount of, uh, I mean, either, either if it's one contract or another one. You, you still uh, uh, spend the same amount of uh, uh, ether to run the specific instruction. So if I have uh, a con for free construction, yes. But, yeah. but a more complex sure. contract uh, would be more expensive. But what I'm saying is, like, if if you can, uh, if you have like a, a contract that becoming so, uh, I mean, the, the, I mean, this doesn't necessarily have to be one contract. But if the price of the ether to simplify the instruction. It's going to be right. to be. So, so why, is, why is it becoming so so rich or so expensive? The reason it, it would could possibly become uh, rich and expensive is because it's providing valuable services to people or other contracts that are paying it. Um, yeah. In which case, it, it's economically liable and deserves success, uh, and it should have success for as long as it continues to to successfully serve its user base. If, if it gets too expensive and some other app developer um, comes up with a simpler solution or, or, or a, su a sufficient solution that's less expensive, then contracts and people will, will move to that one. Okay. Okay, let, let's, let's move on. And, and uh, Joseph, you, if you'll make, you, how many, who has questions? Anybody, maybe, we're, maybe we have, anybody who's willing to admit that they have a question? Okay. <clears throat> Hi Joseph, thanks for speaking with us. Um, I had a question about the operations, uh, the operation cost or the opcode cost or the computation cost. You said it was going to evolve market based. You're talking about the base fee, you're not talking about the actual opcode costs that are listed in the white paper, right? Uh, the base fee, yeah. Okay. 
So the other question is kind of fall. But, but also, like, those, those costs are, are scalar values, uh, and they're not going to be fixed. If you let them float, it's going to be hard to profile your code. Yeah, I, I understand that. Okay. So just following up on what Chris okay. said. I, I, so that pricing is very important. Yeah, so just following up on what Chris said, I mean, I can see a situation where if for whatever reason there's a killer app or a killer contract, like remember, there's going to be one theoretically sports betting contract, and, um, you know, we can all write one. They're not that hard, but, you know, Chris has assembly experience and will, you know, opcode, optimize it to death, and it will be the cheapest contract you can run. And so every sports bet in the universe, theoretically, could be Chris's contract. And of course, that's going to crush every other sports betting contract, let's say, or any other futures contract. You could be in situations where if you really look at base financial contracts, there's really only 30 base financial contract types out there. As soon as someone writes the very best, most optimized one, the other ones are going to sort of fall away. And so what will happen is, if Ether is expensive enough, contracts are going to have to be short. I mean, really short, to the point where you're not really getting these, these big, you know, DAO voting type systems out there. No one's going to run those. People are going to just be using it for very short things. And the other, like, limiting factor of contract size is, it's basically whatever the fastest node can run in a minute. Anything bigger than that is too big to run as a contract, right? Okay, so, so you're saying, um, let me uh, just address the first question. You're saying that um, if sports betting applications in the real meat space world were very, very expensive, then all the people in the world would spend all their money on them. No, no, what I'm saying is that... People have other interests in other... No, 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 but what I'm saying is there's, there's one best contract out there for that particular app. Yeah, that's fine, and until somebody comes up with a better innovation, right. then, then the work to create that best of breed um, niche owning app, um, the reward should go to the person who did, did that. Correct. Um, there, there are going to be so many niches. I, I know there are, I think that's the Willie Bermax work that you're talking about, the, the 30 different contracts. But, um, they, there are so many business niches out there, and maybe, yes, there'll be some optimized tools that, that each one of these larger distributed apps uh, pays to use, and that's fine. Those, those tools will, will own their layer, um, but uh, increasingly sophisticated applications will be built, and they will be built on the shoulders of, of uh, layers of distributed applications, and I can foresee um, an infinite number of layers of complexity um, in creating so many different services that we can't even imagine at this point. Okay, but you're still limited by one minute for now until another version comes out, right? That, that, that is correct, and computation speed uh, does tend to increase every year. Okay. Uh, and parameters, uh, parameters are flexible. Um, the shard model has a good chance of uh, making it so that just a small number of miners um, can process a subset of contracts and uh, um, achieve all of the computation on the network that way in one minute. And all of that's based on economics too. If, uh, um, if the economics um, of running a too complicated system don't work out right now, then maybe you can't release that now. Maybe you have to wait a year. Uh, are you worried that if it's too cheap and the storage is refunded, people are just going to bloat the chain full of movies and whatever else? Um, we, we anticipate that people will uh, do storage distributed applications and broadcasting and communications distributed apps, but probably the most efficient way is to have the command control secure logic layer on Ethereum and have uh, offline resources for bandwidth and storage. Um, it is certainly some people will, will try to store material 
in the blockchain. Um, and we are looking at the refund model. That may not, uh, that may not last. Uh, basically, if, if you charge for long-term storage um, on certain types of data, then, uh, then block float goes, uh, goes away to some degree. Okay, uh, one, so you had a question earlier that we, I'm not certain, did we get that sufficiently answered about mining? Okay, and you also had your hand raised at one point here a second ago. Yeah, just a quick question about the um, about the one best contract. Since it's open source on the blockchain, we'll be able to just copy that and then drive the price down to zero or whatever. Sure. Yeah, there, there's a little bit of discussion here about those uh, one best contract thing. Uh, I, I have a bit more to say about that, unless there's any other questions. Uh, so what, you know, why, why does one company dominate in the real world forever? Well, I think part of the... It's because... Go, go, go ahead. It's just because uh, needs change. Um, paradigms shift. Um, better, more nimble, less expensive competitors emerge. So, but, but along that line, I think part of what uh, um, Andy was, was thinking about is if there's a specific contract, let's say there is a specific betting contract that is optimized, that it might be the only betting contract that is used, or the, the primary one that is used for a long time. But remember, everything is open source. It's possible that in one dimension it's optimized, but uh, what about the user interface? Well, um, and the, I think user one, of the one of the, one thing that I'm, I'm not certain, I just wanted to remind Andy of, is that there is, has been a little bit of discussion in Ethereum about uh, making that frequently used contracts into something that's a little closer to an opcode. So if it's used frequently, then that would, would drive down the, the cost that would be used take take to, to uh, operate. So, so you can use just-in-time compilation for something like that or, or long-term compiled storage. Um, uh, yeah, that's so, a decision you can make at an architectural level. Okay. So, so you build it, it becomes a filter to the next client because it's got so much usage, right? Or something like that. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm just telling you what I've heard. I actually yeah. don't, no, I, I've heard that too, may, like, maybe Joseph knows more details about this. Like, like the crypto functions, we're taking those out. Someone's going to actually write them in, in LLL or CLL, and then they'll end up eventually being if they're using them. Off -codes. Okay. Yeah. So Andy is 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 uh, talking about how the the cryptocurrencies. He's saying that that has been discussed to use this mechanism that I described. Do you have any more to say about that, Joseph? Uh, no. Okay. Well, so um, I'm looking. Oh, Joel, did you have a question? Yeah, economics. We had a question for Joseph. Um, Joseph, uh, most cryptocurrencies so far have tracked the Bitcoin price to a certain degree. So if you look at the charts for Litecoin, you can see that you know when Bitcoin goes up, Litecoin goes up, and when Bitcoin goes down, Litecoin goes down. And I wonder, um, with this sort of cryptocurrency 2.0 stuff, including Ethereum, if you think that tracking will continue or what the dynamics will be. This is obviously like... Uh, to some degree, I can... Go ahead. Oh, this is obviously vis-a-vis -vis sort of fiat currency, like USD, so. Sure, right. Yeah, so in the early stages, I can imagine cryptocurrency 2.0 systems tracking Bitcoin uh, until they differentiate themselves, create their own markets and, uh, and utility. Uh, the different uh, two point, the sophisticated 2.0 projects are not crones of Bitcoin. Um, they're, they're very different kinds of entities. So why does it make sense for Litecoin to, to rise and fall with Bitcoin? Um, the the 2.0 space is uh, conceptually and functionally a, a different kind of animal. And so as Ethereum grows and differentiates itself more, becomes its own economy, has its own utility, um, I don't think it will track Bitcoin at all. Uh -huh. Very good. 
Mike, you had a question earlier, please. Uh, yeah, this is a little more of a technical question. So earlier we saw the contract uh, being in the pipeline, I guess. Um, I saw somewhere online that there's various languages that contracts can be written in, or what, what's sort of the stage or the status of how contracts can be written? Yeah, so uh, Joseph, the question is, uh, uh, Joel gave this example which uh, looked very close to, to Python and, and Mike is asking, asking what languages are, will be available in which to write contracts in the future. Um, there will be a Python-like language at the point where I see language. Um, there's a Risk-like language. Um, and um, there, there are plans for a bunch of different languages. Um, we can't really enable a full language yet, if ever. Um, a, a full use of, say, something like Python. Um, just, it, it needs to be a strict end version. And so, if it's a strict end version, then you don't know what to call it Python. So, uh, more, more languages in the future. I, I can't give you more detail on that at this point. So my understanding, Mike, is that uh, if you are a guru enough, you could write a compiler for your own language and implement it and write contracts in your own language and use your compiler to compile to the Ethereum script, which is a low-level assembly-like language. Is that correct, Joseph? Exactly. And if your name, if your name is Vitalik, you can do it in an afternoon. <laughs> okay. I, uh, uh, Joseph. Yeah the, yeah, the question is, what is, there's something like eight founders. What, what is your main role yeah. among the founders? Uh, my main role, we're, we're trying to, it, it's still early days, and we're still setting up business structures, and um, so, so we're, we don't have official titles yet. Um, if I were close to speaking about an official title, it would be a, Provisional chief operating officer, but but again, nothing is set in stone. Um, and uh, I think we're sort of thinking that maybe we will go with traditional titles, um, even though it's a very untraditional organization in a traditional space. But just for ease of communication with the rest of the world, it, it's easier to put uh, some labels on things that are easier to understand. Please, please come up. So I'm trying to understand how Ethereum is um, going to solve a problem which is, I, I think, been largely solved uh, today with uh, regular money, which is uh, transaction costs. Um, so far, I've seen with Bitcoin, there are large transaction costs for taking money out of the system, and because it's not widely accepted, um, you know, through all you know, a lot of banks, that. Um, you know, right now, if you do currency transfers internationally, one of the benefits I see of being able to trade something, with, you know, with uh, Ether. Uh, how are you going to go about uh, solving the problem of high transaction costs? Because right now, um, just with currency transactions between uh, different countries, you can trade, uh, you, you can transfer for you know, fractions of one percent. Uh, in, 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 in fiat currency, I guess what you're talking about. There. Yeah, right? like every month I trade. Uh, currency between uh, the U.S. and Australia, and depending on the size of the transaction, it can be you know 0.1% uh, and one day to do it. Um, but with something like um, Bitcoin or um, Ether, which you know the value to me is in Ether because that's why what people would want to mine in the first place to have something. Okay. Or if they're even if they're using a contract, um, if, if the contract means exchanging something of value, essentially it's exchanging that. Um, you don't want to lose a great percentage on that contract. Uh, let's say that one of the examples given was escrow, where you might be putting you know, $10,000 in escrow and you could trade it with a contract potentially, but you don't want to lose 3% 3, 3 of that, uh, which you might lose when you try and draw it out because it's not, um, it's not as uh, liquid as regular currency. Okay, like. let's give Joseph a chance to respond. Exactly. Yeah, so um, a few different answers to that. Uh, one is that... Um, Similar to the Ripple network, um, there will be distributed exchanges. 
exchanges, um, and a lot of people, it, it will be relatively easy to run a distributed exchange, and there will be identification systems and reputation systems um, so that you can, people can rate um, the groups or individuals that are running distributed exchanges. Um, so in terms of uh, exchange of legacy currencies into cryptocurrencies, um, All right. it, it will be better in the sense that the exchanges are distributed rather than centralized, um, and if, uh, if they're done properly, um, there won't be, um, everything will be done on the blockchain, and so you won't get the situation like Mt. Gox, where they're holding a lot of Mt. Gox Bitcoin tokens that really have no relationship to actual, so no, no fractional reserve banking. Uh, but the real answer to your question is, uh, is once the friction, the, the, the expense is all about um, um, trying to bootstrap a, a crypto economy um, in a weak space world um, where centralized governments and corporations are in control. Um, and so they're, they're kind of the gatekeepers. We're trying to onboard a lot of people and value into Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Um, but the friction isn't in Bitcoin, the friction is interfacing to the legacy systems, and that's where the costs come from. So uh, for, for the Bitcoin space, when, uh, when the economy matures, um, you will see uh, more people being paid in Bitcoin, more people um, being able to live their lives in Bitcoin, and then that, that friction uh, with the legacy currency goes away. Um, at, at this point, we're seeing a, a drop in value uh, of Bitcoin, partly because of Gox, but also partly because of the success of, of adoption. Uh, a lot of Bitcoin has sat uh, in people's wallets, and people have been dying to spend it, and now they can buy stuff at Tiger, and buy stuff online, and, and go into space. And so a lot of that Bitcoin is actually uh, being turned into fiat legacy currency just because all these new businesses are starting to adopt it. So there's, there's been there's a, a glut of supply on the market. Um, when these businesses start to build out their supply chains, and this is happening rapidly, um, basically if, if you're a baker and, and you, uh, you're taking Bitcoin, you're going to talk to your delivery person or your flower person and say, hey, you need to consider taking Bitcoin. And so once that happens and people stop doing the conversion, um, we'll get a full fundamental economy um, fully in Bitcoin. Uh, the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum is that um, most of the value of Bitcoin was speculative for many years, and that speculative value enabled, um, sort of like a tentpole, enabled uh, a fundamental economy to be built under the speculative tent, and that, that fundamental economy is starting to take shape. Um, Ethereum is all about a fundamental economy. There, there was really no, no great demand for, for Bitcoin in the early days, even in the first few years, except for a few small niche uses. Um, in Ethereum, that would be true. In Ethereum, from day one, there will be significant demand for the businesses that uh, exist on the ecosystem. And so I think that there will be some friction and some expense onboarding um, people and value um, into Ethereum. But uh, I expect once it's there, uh, it's not going to leave very long. Does that answer the question? Please. Yeah, so Joseph, when will the pre-sale be? Do you have any updates on that? Um, it's looking like sometime in April. Uh, nothing I said here is set in stone. Okay. <laughs> so don't hold me to it and, and don't, uh, don't publish it in, uh, so in, in Forbes. Could you tell us, there, tell us the date? There, there's some sort of uh, an event in Toronto, I believe, in April. Is that correct? Yeah. And what mm -hmm. date is that? 
Yeah, there, there, there's, a, there's a Toronto Bitcoin conference, and Ethereum will have uh, a very, very large presence and, and uh, presentations there. I believe, the, I believe it starts on the 11th. And uh, I, I heard... Does it? Does it I heard someone say that they, they wanted to have it ready, by the, the pre-sale by that conference. Is that, is that uh, we want we want to have all the mechanism ready significantly before the conference, um, and we are having external auditors vet our system. Some very um, gifted, uh, very well-known people, um, and um, so yeah. I, ideally, we're ready to go before April. And then it's just a question of making sure everybody has enough advance notice um, so that they can read a um, business plan and make their own decisions, make their preparations. And then we want to make sure that we're not at a conference when the, when the sale is, is on. Um, so we, we don't want to do two major things at the same time. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So, right. so uh, either before or after. Okay, Mike. Will there be a limited? Uh, will there be a limited valuation up for sale in terms of Bitcoin? Yeah, Mike. Or, yeah, Mike's, Mike's asking is, will there be a limit on the amount that a person could invest in Ethereum? Um, a, a person can can buy uh, from any number of different identities. We may limit the size, the, the unit size of a sale, um, just to um, make it easier to disguise. Um, if, let's say if you're a whale and you want some privacy, um, you can buy um, 50,000 units. And to, just uh, um, so, so nobody scares people with, uh, with an enormous initial purchase. So if you are a whale, if you want to plan on investing uh, several million US dollars worth, um, then you can do that in uh, for multiple identities. Uh, we will um, ask for a real world identity in the form of uh, email address just so that we can make sure that everything works smoothly the whole way through the process. Um, but we won't be required. So we can create um, a pseudonymous email on identity and national purchasing. Um, in terms of total cap, um, we wanted to cap the amount of ether that we would sell initially um, because we didn't want to have too much um, too much money that we were responsible for. Um, but uh, we've been discussing it for a long, long time in a lot of different ways, and um, we were in the fairest way to do this, have an uncapped sale. No, we, don't, we don't want any sort of circumstances where one or a small number of whales comes in uh, and buys way too much ether and shuts all, a lot of other people out. It, it's very important to dis distribute ether as widely as possible and to give everybody a chance to get into it. So, uh, let's thank Joseph Lubin for coming here.